Hello, today's talk is going to be somewhat more arcane, somewhat more scientific perhaps than some of the ones I give. And I'm afraid it relies on concepts from mathematics and concepts in a sense from physics in order to justify ideas about the labor theory of value. It should be seen as a possible substitute for what is talked about by the value form theorists, but an approach to it from a completely different direction, an approach to it from a much more modern direction, if you can say something post-1900 is modern. Now, let's start off by talking about the law of value. What law is this? It's a popular term among Marxists, though Marx doesn't use it a great deal. The problem is it's got no precise definition of the type we would expect for a scientific law. If you think of um, the gas laws, Ohm's law, Hooke's law, etc., these have a concise definition which allows any um, scientist to repeat tests to see whether these laws are, be, uh, are followed. But it's doubtful that anywhere in the Marxist literature do you get a, a comparable definition, testable definition of what the law of value means. If you go back to the 1920s, uh, and again in the early 50s, you had Soviet Marxists debating whether the law of value applied to the USSR. And they did this without saying what they meant by the law. Stalin is in, in his influential part, pamphlet on the economic problems of socialism, argued that the law of value applied in the sense that it applied to what you could do with commercial, commercial products that were sold. But he seemed to, to mean that it didn't apply to the economy as a whole, by which he meant that market mechanisms didn't regulate the, the whole resources of the economy. In his terminology, in the terminology of a lot of the Soviet authors of the 1950s, the law of value seemed to be roughly the same as saying market mechanisms. Again in the 50s, um, the Italian communist Bordiga wrote a reply to Stalin in which he said that if you want to determine whether the law of value operated in Russia, you just had to go to a Russian market and see potatoes exchanging for rubles. For, for Bordiga, the law of value simply meant an exchange of equivalents as it established by a commodity transaction. And it was the act of exchange which made things equivalent. In a way, this is what a lot of the uh, value form theorists later on are getting at. The problem is that none of these are formal definitions. I, I think I would like to define it as follows. The law of value states that value understood as the labour time socially necessary to produce a commodity is conserved in exchanges between commodities. I think that is the essence of what is being said in the first volume of Capital. There are several advantages to defining it this way. You, it's stated in the form of a normal scientific law. It's empirically testable, has a precise meaning, and it emphasises the fundamental Marxian proposition that value cannot arise in circulation. Simply saying that exchange proves that value is there doesn't prove that the Marxian law of value is operating. It just shows that you've got exchange. It could be exchange according to some different law. Now, it's worth saying that 
this is not the same sense of conservation principle that is used by what's called the new solution to the transformation problem. But it's hardly new now since it dates from the 1980s. In the new solution, value is conserved across the aggregate of all exchanges. The problem with this is it's not a empirically testable proposition. It's simply a stipulation defining the aggregate value of money. And it would be true even if commodities exchanged in proportion to the amount of energy that they contained rather than the amount of money they contained. In aggregate, you could still define money as a relationship between money and labour such that the right aggregate relations held, but it would tell you nothing about the proportionate relations between sections of the economy. What I'm saying is that value is conserved in the exchange between different classes of commodities. Obviously, you don't expect to find it holding exactly. Like many scientific laws, it has a stochastic character. There's some random fluctuation around it. But what we're saying is that if you look at distinct industries or sections of the economy, the value of their outputs will tend to, the value at which their outputs exchange with one another will tend to be proportional to their labour content. And it won't be proportional to, for example, their rubber content or their steel content. Now, in approaching the form of value, I'm not using Hegel. I'm using someone somewhat more recent, though still over 100 years ago. I'm using the approach of, of Emily Nuther, the German mathematician, who said that to every conservation law there's a symmetry. And instead of arguing about value form in Hegelian terms, I'm going to use geometry. Geometry enables us to pose the problem of exchange value with greater generality and conciseness. Now, you may be saying, why geometry? Well, I'm using geometry in the abstract, uh, mathematical or algebraic geometry, rather than um, solid geometry, for example. And a lot of Marxian economics is actually posed in terms of vectors and vector spaces, which are geometrical constructions. And for that matter, geometry turns out to have applications for all sorts of things which you wouldn't think it would have. Vector space geometry is used by Google, for example, in its query systems. So things which are not immediately apparently geometrical problems turn out on closer examination to be expressible in terms of geometry and the essential properties of them turn out to be expressible in terms of geometrical symmetries. Now I'm going to have to start out by defining some mathematical terms. I'm starting out by saying what a metric is, which is a basic concept in, in, in modern geometry. A metric space, which we label S and D, is a space which is a set of elements together with a real valued function D. Now, this notation says that D is a function which takes an element from the set S, another element from the set S, and yields you a real number, the curly R. Which, and this function D is a distance measure between points. So if you have two points P and Q in the set S, D obeys the following axioms. It's commutative. That is to say, the distance from P to Q is the distance from Q to P. It's positive. The, the distance between um, P and Q is always greater than zero and less than infinity. 
if P and Q are not identical. If they are identical, the distance is zero. And the triangle inequality must hold. That is, if, say, if you've got three points forming a triangle, the distance between them along one side is always less than the distance going three ways around in the triangle. So if we've got a PQR, our points on the triangle, the distance between P and Q is always less than the distance from going from P to R and then from R to Q. Think of that in terms of travelling. It's always faster to go directly from Edinburgh to London than is to go first from Edinburgh to Dublin and then from Dublin to London. Now, the examples of metric spaces that we're familiar with, well, the first one is the one that seems to correspond to the world we live in, at least to a good approximation, which is Euclidean space. And in the Euclidean space, the distance is given by Pythagoras' metric, that if you've got on a if you've got a flat surface in a Euclidean space and you measure the distance in the x direction and the distance in the y direction, you want to find the distance between P and Q under those circumstances. You take the square root of the sum of the squares of the distance in the x and y direction, which is basically what that's saying. This is saying the distance in the in direction one, the distance in direction two, square each of them and take the square root and that gives you the distance. That's Pythagoras' theorem. And it generalizes to arbitrary dimensional vector spaces. And these are the vector spaces we're used to dealing with. The, because they're the generalization of classical geometry. But what happened in the 19th century is that people realized that there were other forms of geometry other forms of geometry than, than the uh, Euclidean space. So let's take another example, the what's often called the Manhattan space, sometimes called the Min Minkowski space. Um, it's, it's named after the Manhattan street plan, where the streets all got right angles to one another. And basically it measures how far you would have to walk following these streets to get between two direct two points in the city. And you can't go in a straight line between them. You have to walk along the north-south or the east-west axes of the streets. And the metric for man for travelling in the city of Manhattan is the distance is the uh, between two corners in the city is a distance along the north-south axis and the distance plus the distance on the east-west axis. And in the Manhattan metric, the distances are always greater than in the Euclidean metric. Uh, something to notice about this, in Euclid's or Pythagoras' metric, you square and take a square root. That ensures you always have a positive distance. In the Manhattan metric, you take absolute values, these vertical bars here. That again shows that po distances are always positive. Now I'm going to do something else and say that if you've got an, uh, a set and you've got points Q and R and they're equal with respect to P if they're equidistant from P under the metric D. So I'm saying two points are equivalent to one another if they are the same distance from some other point, from some other point P. And this 
is essentially the abstract concept you need to generate a circle. A circle in Euclidean space is made up of all points which are equidistant under the Euclidean metric from its center x here. So a circle is an equality set of points that are rendered equal under this metric. Now, there's a, an equality set in Manhattan space, except it has an unexpected shape. It's a diamond. If this is the Manhattan street plan and you're si starting in position X and you want to find all positions in the city that are the same distance away from X, you will find they're laid out in a diagonal diamond like that. Because these are all points where the sum of the distance you'd have to walk, walk north and south plus the sum of the distance you'd have to walk east and west is the same. So the point here is the concept of a circle defined as an equality set is an abstract idea that goes beyond our immediate sensory approximation or perception of what a circle is. Now why am I talking about circles? What has this got to do with value? Well the point is that value is a metric on commodities. Value is a metric. In order to apply geometrical concepts to the law of value, we define a commodity bundle space as follows. A commodity bundle of order 2 is a set of pairs A of X and B of Y, whose elements are A of commodity X and B of commodity Y. A commodity bundle space of order 3 is a triple A of X, B of Y, C of Z, etc. And so you can go on to commodity bundle spaces of arbitrary dimensions. I'm not saying these are vector spaces yet. So these kinds of distinctions between vector spaces and bundles etc are the sorts of things you make uh, if you're a computer scientist and you want to distinguish between types. Now, suppose we assumed that um, commodity bundle space was Manhattan. We would have bundles composed of iron and corn in our case. I've got an iron axis and a corn axis. And the set of all points equidistant with EF from AB would be this Manhattan diamond. These points are all the same distance in commodity bundle space from A of iron and B of corn in Manhattan space. However, that's just assuming it's Manhattan space. And in general, whichever metric it turns out the commodities um, have, there will be a set of nested circles, circles in the abstract sense, which make these positions increasingly valuable with respect to the origin. I've shown a set of nested diamonds and each di position on this diamond, if you had a Manhattan metric, would have the same value and each position on this diamond would have a different value. The same would be true if I had Euclidean metrics where the circles would be circles of the sort that we're used to. And Whichever metric we take, so long as it's used consistently, each point in the space belongs to only one such equality set under the given metric. OK, now I, I, I can see this is a relatively abstract argument, but the question is, why is this relevant? What I'm saying, if the elements of a set of commodity bundles are mutually exchangeable, that is to say, if the exchange is equivalent, then they form an equality set under some metric. And if we observe, examine the observed 
equality sets that exist in commodity relations, we can deduce the properties of the underlying metric space which governs commercial society. Now, if you open a, um, an economics textbook, you'll get diagrams here which are termed in their terms budget lines. I'm, I'm calling them isovals. And if this is corn and this is iron, according to an economics textbook, any point on this, what's called a budget line, has the same value. There is a ratio in which I can give up iron and take on corn without any loss of value. And this is set by the exchangeable ratios between them. And as I say, these are what the economists call budget lines, but mathematically, these are equality sets. And the slope of the equality sets are given by the exchange values, the relative exchange values of the two commodities. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's clear that commodity space has a non-Euclidean and for what it's worth a non-Manhattan geometry. It has a, the metric of commodity space can't be the metric of normal, the normal space we live in, the normal Euclidean space we live in. Nor is it the metric of a Manhattan street plan. So what is the metric that uh, commodity space obeys? It has a slightly different, rather uh, Manhattan-like metric, but this is the formula. The distance between two points is given by two ratios, alpha and beta, which are exchange ratios or exchange values, and the distance from the origin in the x and the y directions. You sum those and take the absolute value. Now that's different from the Manhattan metric where you take the absolute value and sum. Now, okay, this is something which people intuitively know in commodity practice, in commercial practice. They know that if they're doing a stock taking they add up the sum of the stocks they hold and multiply them by their values and they get a, a total value of their stock. But there's something particular about this kind of metric. It occurs elsewhere. You get this metric, for example, in energy conservation. Now, it may not immediately be obvious, but here I'm, I'm giving you a diagram of a phase space diagram of an object on a ballistic trajectory in a vacuum, thrown upwards and then falls down again. Let's assume you're doing it on the moon. And the x-axis here is the, f it's a phase space, so the x-axis represents its velocity in the vertical direction and the y-axis is its altitude. And we get this parabolic shake. Now, this is where Nuther's approach comes, because Nuther was talking about um, movement in space. The point is that all these points on the trajectory are freely exchangeable with one another. They, they, over time, they move from one position to another on this phase space diagram. They are um, traced out over time on the phase space diagram. And that, that's equivalent to saying these are equivalent or exchangeable with one another. But it doesn't look like the equivalent set of commodity values until we do something. We take, a, we take the, the velocity axis and we square it. So if, it, if we take that diagram and for each point square the velocity axis and replot it here, what do we get? We get that diagram. We get a straight line. 
By squaring the velocity axis, we get a measure proportional to what physicists call kinetic energy. Now, if you've done physics at school, you'll know about kinetic energy. But this kinetic energy is something that is only revealed through its exchange relation with height. Physics posit this, physicists posit this one-dimensional substance called energy through observing conservative exchange between different forms of energy. And this conservative exchange actually comes down to being able to plot these kinds of diagrams in which altitude and velocity squared exchange with one another on a straight line as you plot it. We've as much reason to conser conclude that there is something called value being conserved in commodity exchanges as we have to conclude there is something called energy being conserved in the motion of a freely falling body. In both cases, the existence of this conserved quantity is revealed by an abstract geometric symmetry. We're so used to the idea of energy conservation, we don't realise that that is the underlying justification the physicists have for it. Now, if we look more closely at the metric that I've defined for commodity space, we find that the budget line is only half the story, literally half the story. You've got this line here. The important point is it extends beyond the axis because it allows you to have a negative quantity of iron. If I'm on this line, an increasing quantity of corn can be offset by a negative quantity of iron. What does that mean? Negative quantity of iron means that you owe someone or have promised to deliver someone a quantity of iron. And your wealth position can be offset by actually having more corn, which you can later exchange for iron to make that delivery of iron. But if you try and plot the unit circle in commodity bundle space, you find that it's actually made up of two parallel lines. It's not the Euclidean circle. It's not a diamond shape. It's two parallel lines. And these are the conjugate isovals. All points on PQR are are equidistant from the origin and mutually exchangeable. That's to say, any combination of holdings of iron and corn on that isoval have the same value and should be exchangeable. Similarly, all points on this are mutually exchangeable and the same distance from the origin. Except all points on this have negative values of iron and negative values of, of um, corn or where they have negative values of, of, of where they have positive values of corn their negative value of iron offsets it. These points are all mutually exchangeable. These points are all mutually exchangeable but they're not connected. The geometric form given by the metric of commodity space means that the unit circle is combined, is formed of two disjoint sections. And what does that? That seems just an argument about geometry. But we can see that it's actually, when you translate it into social relations, tells you something very important. This is credit and this is debt. Debt is debt and credit is credit and near the twain shall meet. 
there is no set of commodity exchanges by which someone in this on this position can ever get to this position. Someone in this position is always a net debtor. Someone in this position is always a net creditor. And no set of equivalent exchanges can move you from there to there. Now that is an argument constructed solely from the geometrical properties of the metric of commodity exchange. So, what have I been able to say? I've said this is the metric of commodity value space. I've said it's conformant with conservation laws and that therefore it's conformant with there being something conserved in commodity exchanges. The mathematical form of that metric predicts the existence of debt and debt traps. But it doesn't say what the substance is that's conserved. It's empirical research that shows that the, what is being conserved is labour, not energy, not rubber, not uh, corn or any other input to the economy. It's labour. That's established empirically. But the important point is that the formal structure of commodity exchange says there must be something conserved in it. And this is what Marx is saying in a non-geometric way when he analyzes exchange value at the start of the, the first chapter, the first volume of Capital. He is using a something like a more syllogistic reasoning to say that there must be some third thing that is conserved. Now what I'm saying is you can take essentially the same points that Marx is making and put it in a modern language, put it in the language of modern physics and say yes there is a conservation law there and there is a conservation law which we can deduce from the abstract mathematical properties of the exchange. Now the fact that the conservation is actually a conservation of energy, sorry not of energy, of labour, is something that is empirically established. Um, for those who are interested here are some papers which establish that it actually is labour that has been conserved and that can only be done by econometric studies of the uh, exchange values of the outputs of different industries compared to their labour content. I have made this set of slides available online so that uh, you can look these up there or you can stop the video and copy down the references here.